hallelujahs, and the ones on the left, praising the Lord.
gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we just sang to be like Jesus. You <coughs> give us a glimpse of Jesus once again this morning. Because we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Good morning and happy Sabbath. It is good to see all of you have taken time and to visit this church and worship the good Lord on this holy day. During this week, I received information about one of our believers who was sharing with me that her aunt has some cardiac problem she's going through. During the sharing, I saw the faith and the pain that struggle. Throughout the week, all of us goes through our personal struggle, whether it is a physical related problem, medical related problem, psychological problem, family problem, maybe even a social problem or work problem. But all of these, we also experience the presence of God. How the Lord, in a mighty way, gives us the strength and strengthens us to be faithful and dependent on Him. Here we have come with that kind of experience to praise the Lord and to worship Him in this holy day. Amen. We want to thank the Lord for bringing all of you together. We are happy to have Brother Arnold and the people who gathered with him to worship in his home. We want to welcome you, extend a warm welcome to you. And uh, Dr. Rajkumar is here. Thank you, Dr. Rajkumar, for taking time and giving us your dedication and your time for us to be it and come closer to God. And he will be officially introduced by Pastor Johnson a little later with, about the preach. So once again, thank you for coming. May the Lord fill all of us with the Holy Spirit. And I see uh, two people from this old church. And one welcome both of you here. Good to see you. God bless you. And uh, let us all stand and sing hymn number 517. My faith looks up to thee. My faith looks up to thee. 517. Let us all stand and sing.
scripture meditation this morning. It's taken from Luke 8 chapter, verses 46 to 50. Luke 8 chapter, verses 46 to 50. And Jesus said, Somebody has touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. While he was, while he had spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead, trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. May the Lord add his blessings on the both of scripture and Amen. Time to worship the Lord with our prayer and supplications and any request for prayer. Any request for prayer? Mr. David? Yeah, my brother is having some problem with his legs and uh, let's remember him. Any others? Mr. Churchill? Yeah, Sir Churchill, is today. You all can hear better. I don't hear nicely. I only hear what I want. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, Okay. There's a person named Linda from India. She had three daughters, like three kids. All three are not well. They all, all three are admitted in the hospital. So she asked me to pray for them. Okay. We come to the altar to present our supplication to you, God. Those who want to come to the Praying is dealing, not standing, not sitting, but dealing. So, those who want to come to the front, come. Those who cannot, it's okay, wherever you are, let's all be as we seek the Lord in praying. Holy God, righteous Father, we thy children have come to praise sing praises unto thee, and to meditate upon thy holy name. Lord in heaven, come into our midst. Speak to each one of us as we wait upon thee. Lord in heaven, bless each head that God in thy presence. Bless us according to our needs. Bless the Lord that belong to us, and the relatives who are far away. Be with them all, and bind us all with your love. Master Father, we pray for thy church throughout the world and they worship thee, bless them and grant unto them their needs. May they feel thy presence as they listen to the speakers and may you speak to the speakers the message that we need. Master Father, we thank you for the leadership of thy church. Give them wisdom. 
We pray for the preachers who are doing thy gospel work. Give them thy strength and thy wisdom. Protect them. As Father, we also remember the sick ones. There are many on their sick beds. And many of us who are, whose names are mentioned here, we need you and your healing touch. But Father, we pray, may every name that is mentioned here be heard in thy presence. May they receive answers from thee. But Father, we pray for the sick in general. Bless them all. Heal them. We pray for the service of doctors and nurses and all the medical personnel. Bless their service. <coughs> Keep them under thy care. God be Lord, we pray that you be with those who are in sorrow. Comfort them, Lord. Give them thy comforting hand over them. Most of Father, we also pray that you be with those who are in troubled circumstances. Give them peace. Father in heaven, we pray to bless the church, bless all of us, help us all to come closer to you and closer to each other. We thank you for the speaker that's appointed for today. As Dr. Rajkumar brings the message, touch his lips and speak to him. Give us the message that we need for this day. Once again, we pray to God to forgive us our sins and shortcomings of our values. Fill us all with thy spirit. Lead us all in the path that lead to your kingdom. We pray these blessings in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.
director for that uh, ministry in music. I also noticed that uh, this morning we, this house is filled with instrumentalists. Starting with you, I see John over there, of course Timmy was there, Annan, and uh, probably some more. But I can tell you, Nathan is out there directing his mother while she's playing. <laughs> Happy Sabbath, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Ministry of Giving. I'm going to read from your hymn book, number 821. That's not really the whole <laughs> But I will encourage you to get in the mood of giving, uh, and, and when you get home, to be uh, the whole thing yourself, so don't permit any stanza or page. Um, for those of you online, my sister Stella and the rest of you, I welcome you, everybody on Zoom, and everybody here. See that you excel in this grace of giving, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, Yet, for your sakes, he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. If the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly, you can chime in, will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap, chime in, generously. Each man should give what he has decided in, the, in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves the cheerful giver. Amen? Amen? So it's time for us to participate in the art of giving to support the ministry of the church. In this church we have uh, a tradition. We call for special offerings, tithe, birthday, Thanksgiving, remembrances, and whatever else. So if you have any of those offerings, just as you came up to the altar, please come forward and drop them in this place. If you have offerings like that, I'd like you to come up and drop them in this place. And if you don't, or you're too shy, just hand them over to the deacons. At this time, we can begin to collect our eyes and offerings. Please come forward. <laughs>
Father in heaven, thank you for your grace and generosity to us in every way. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to return just a small portion of that which you have given to us. Bless our little efforts that you may yield big fruits, this and other things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
Um, I'm not sure that we did that, but everyone, welcome back. And come back again and again and again. All right. We are privileged to a message song by Mr. and Mrs. Bernadette. Can choose any mighty one or let us bring it to you. That one? Okay, fine. Happy Sabbath. I guess we were doing some sign languages earlier, we didn't know if we were doing it. Bye bye, right? Then we do bye bye, okay? Uh, we were just playing around with the snow. So that's really nice. Thank you so much for sharing that song. So we're going to do a wonderful, merciful Savior. God is such a wonderful God. And we're here to bring that song to you today.
Thank you both for that wonderful song. Thank you. God bless you. Usually when they introduce somebody, they get information early. But I don't have any information. I didn't collect any information. Now only pastor said I am going to introduce it. But I am going to tell what I know about them. When I went to Nasapur High School as a maybe sixth standard, as I don't know the standard. When I went there, one Mr. Anandra was there. He was very punctual for everything. How I know? He is the well brilliant for our school. He, all the timings he controls. He, he was very prompt. And later on, when he went to went away to Spicer College, he finished his studies, came back as, uh, as a worker. My parents were working in one place where there was a nine lady. And they proposed my nine lady to this young man that time, Mr. Anand Raj, and Mary Grace. Mary Grace. My parents were the ones who gave Bible studies and baptized. And then they were in charge of the marriage. Later on, God blessed them with four children. Two boys and two girls. Anand Raj. Anand is given to the first son. Rajkumar is given to the second son. And the two daughters, I don't know their names. <laughs> but uh, when doctor and his wife were studying at Manipal and other places, I knew them. And uh, when I came here many years ago, when Ranul was here, he was playing the organ. I thought he would play the organ, but he did not sit there. He is a good musician. And God blessed Dr. Rajkumar and his wife with two children, two boys, and they worked in different places, two sweet and other places. And now, currently, he is a medical director for our hospital in Bangalore. Bangalore Hospital he is the medical director, and they are doing a good job. How I know? My granddaughter is a nurse there. <laughs> and she gives bring the news to the doctors. And uh, so we know all about that. When, uh, when we heard that he is coming to America, the, wherever, whenever, wherever people mention his name, they didn't tell about a good doctor, but he's a good, good preacher. I thought they would say good, good doctor. My granddaughter told me. <coughs> Both of them were very good. And, uh, but here, every, anyone who talks about Dr. Rajkumar, they said he's a good preacher. His father was a preacher, and he's a preacher. I'm sure God has a message for us through Dr. Rajkumar. Dr. Rajkumar, we can invite you. Thank you very much. And may God bless you. What a wonderful privilege it is for me to be among uh, these wonderful saints of God who are meeting here, both from the Hope side and Calvary. 
church. And I deem it as a great opportunity and uh, the time that we could spend together. I've enjoyed the lovely music that you have played, the song that set the tone, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Charles. Hearts always hunger for. I hope that we are gripped with that hunger as we worship God today. I plead with you as we are going to study God's word that you keep praying that truly the ethos of our heart will be fulfilled this morning as we begin to listen to God's word. Because we are at a time that each one of us needs an encounter with God. An encounter that transforms. An encounter that transforms. I was visiting your beautiful country and uh, what a privilege it is to go around these places and see some wonderful uh, events that are taking place and the landscape is really awesome. This Thursday I happened to meet or I happened to go and see a very unique place which you are all familiar with and that is Lancaster, Pennsylvania and that's a place where the Amish people stay. And as uh, I have come to know them, it seemed to be they are all kind of, a, uh, you know, weird kind of a people who live in the backdrop, in the shadows. But the more I came to know about them, the more fascinated I have become. And as I was enjoying these wonderful scenes and trying to grasp it, in that very place, Something had happened in 2006, October 2nd. There was a man by the name of Robert Charles, Charles Robert. He was a driver who would uh, drive their milk van, a milk truck. He happened to go to their school, which is given here. There, you know that uh, their schools are sparsely placed. And here in this school, all the children were meeting together and the teacher was there. That day, the brightness of the sun darkened and thickened so much that something unthinkable happened. This man was known to those people, so all the children would be, uh, invited him. He came into this room and asked the boys to get out. And also the teacher. Just before he would come, he bid goodbye. He had three little children. One a seven-year-old, another one five-year-old, and the last one was only 11 months. He bid them goodbye. He made a call to his wife and said, you're not going to see me again. He came to this classroom for some unknown reason. He lined up only the girls against the blackboard took out his gun and was about to shoot them. The teacher made frantic calls so that the police would come in, but before that could happen, he shot 10 of them. Except for the bravery of a little girl who was only 13 years old, she was the oldest in that school. She came forward before he could shoot the others, he said, shoot me first. So that this delay would help for the police to come and he can, she can say, because of her bravery, only five died out of the ten that were shot. The question that we begin to ask this morning is that what prompted this man to become a murderer, a mass murderer? What is it that these people, these innocent people have done? How is it that this ordinary man who was going up and down every day, who was known to them, had been transformed to become a vicious murderer that very day? Another question that comes to our mind is, as we begin to ask this, 
what transformation that had taken place in that girl. As she stood to the firing line and took the cross. Transformation. One, to become a mass murderer. Transformation to become a shield for the others. We all need an encounter, an encounter that transforms one way or the other. I want to invite you as we are going to look at this fascinating verses, familiar chapters and stories. We are going to look at snapshots of different events that we already are very familiar and perhaps might be able to dig deep in order to grasp what had happened that day. This story that we find that is written is found in three different places. Matthew the ninth chapter, Mark the fifth chapter and Luke the eighth chapter. The story of this woman with the issue of blood. So familiar. We have heard it over and over again that perhaps it's lost its impact that it would make in our life. But just for a brief moment, we are going to look into the story once again. And as we focus upon this story, I want you to look at what this story means to each one of us. As the story begins to transpire, we need to look into the background before we come to the story of the issue of blood. There was a man by the name of Jairus. We, we all are familiar. And I want you to turn your Bibles to Mark, the fifth chapter, and uh, I want you to look at from verse 25 onwards. In Mark, the fifth chapter, verse 25 onwards, and you can also turn your Bibles to the book of Luke, the eighth chapter. We have looked at it from verse 42 onwards, and uh, we are going to look at this story for a little while. The background of the story, as I told you. Here was a man, his name was Jairus, which we are all familiar. He was a ruler of the synagogue. Very important position in those days. He had a problem, an emergency. His daughter was dying. And he heard that Jesus was making his way and coming back to Capernaum. He was a believer. As soon as Jesus landed, the first thing that he did was he tried to come out of the crowd, meet Jesus right in the front, worship him. Just like any other father whose daughter, only daughter, would be dying with tears in his eyes, he implored to the master and said, please come. I have an emergency. I want you to touch my daughter because she's on deathbed. We find the story also in Mark the ninth chapter and verse 18. Jesus immediately conceded to the request and began to make his way to Jairus' daughter's home. But you'll find that this is a very unique chapter because in this chapter you'll begin to find the story of 1212, the encounter of 1212. You'll find that a lady that was suffering for 12 years and a girl of 12 years old who was on deathbed. Two encounters that we're going to look at this very morning. But as we look into this, I want you to follow carefully what had happened in the background. You'll find that Jesus had just finished speaking to the multitude. He spoke to them about the kingdom of God and makes his way all the way towards the east, southeastern part of the Sea of Galilee. And that's where the Capolis is. You all know the story of how these two men who are filled with demons had come to meet Jesus Christ. There was another fascinating encounter, but the people did not want to do anything with Jesus. Jesus immediately returns back to Capernaum. 
And that's what you see this happening here in the story. Perhaps we might be wondering is why is it that Jesus makes a U-turn quickly back to this place? Why is it that the people in Decapolis did not even want Jesus to be there? Why is it that Jesus had to rush back to this place? You can see that Jesus comes back quickly. The reason is it gives us an understanding of this fact that God meticulously plans everything in our life. I was thinking what would have happened if Jesus stayed in that village of Decapolis in Galilee. Perhaps Jesus' daughter would have been dead. God, we believe in a God that works behind the scenes. Amen to that? That's the reason why Jesus was rushing back because he knows that there was a man who was desperate to meet him and that was Jairus who believed in him. But so often it happens in our own life just like how it happened on that day. While it was an emergency for Jairus, there was another lady also with a need and she has this issue of blood. So often it happens as we line up ourselves to the hospitals to get attention. There's an intruder that comes and that's what happened. But this is not an emergency. This lady had been suffering for the past 12 years. And this is what it says, a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed by any. This is another lady with great need, but that is not an emergency. And as physicians, you know how you need to try out yourself and to see that you give attention to the most needy people for the first time. You need to see that you're able to attend to them. But here was someone who also pushes her way through and wants to get attention from Jesus. She is a woman having an issue of blood which had spent all her living upon the physicians and she could not be better. She tried her level best to see that she finds some kind of a respite but she was not having it. We all live in a world where we always want to get attention first. Me first attitude. You remember the man that was lying you know, for 38 years, and Jesus went and asked, uh, what do you want? He said, the others come before me, and I'm not able to get my turn. This is the world that we live in. A world where we always want to be the first ones to get attention. And Jairus wanted to get this attention, but somehow he could not get this attention because someone else, came into the limelight. We all live in a fast-paced world. We want fast emails, fast calls, fast video conference, fast food service, fast everything, including fast bribes. <laughs> yes, you have the portals where you can get married. This is the world that we are living in. In fact, we have become so sophisticated that you don't even need to come to the church, isn't it? You have something called as a VR church. You can just hook on and then observe all this in 3D. This is the world that we're living in because everything revolves around ourselves. We want to be the first to be taken care of. You know, the problem and the predicament of this lady is given in Leviticus, the 15th chapter and verse 9. It says here that anyone with this issue of blood will be unclean for one week. And anyone who touched her would be unclean for the whole day. And you can see the predicament that she was going through because she cannot live in a house with people. She was all alone, separated, most probably not married, didn't have children. She was just an unclean person trying her level best to come out of these shackles that she had been in. 
living in total isolation. She could not touch anyone and no one could touch her. And that's the reason why she was so desperate to see Jesus. And it says here that in Mark the fifth chapter and verse 26, it says here that he had spent all that she had and better nothing, but rather be worse and worse. As it happens, the Bible is full of stories that where you begin to come into desperation, that you spend everything and yet you are not alone. Look at some of the examples of running out of all kinds of options that you have. You know about Peter, he had fished all night and caught nothing. What about Cana? Where in the middle of that wonderful function, the ran out of wine. What about the prodigal son? He spent all his living. And at the pool of Bethesda, when he has come to the end of hope, you know why? Miracle comes. Miracle happens when we come to the end of ourselves. The question that we begin to ask is why can't do God do something in the beginning? Why does he allow us to run out of all options before we can really understand the magnanimity of what God can do? The omnipotence of what God can do? Simply because it is only when we are down we keep looking up. Only when we are done, we keep looking up. Till then, we want to try and strive by ourselves to find a way out of the predicament that we are in. But so often, God leads us to these experiences of trying all we can and yet find nothing. This is what had happened. And finally, when she had come to the end of herself, she comes up with this brilliant idea, which we all know. She said, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, if I may but touch, mind you, nobody had given her this idea. Nobody had ever done this before. And she tries something that she had not done before. It is to touch the hem of the garment that she would be made whole. This is what she had. But the problem is that she'll be taking a huge risk. What is the risk that is involved? First of all, she cannot get involved into a crowd. She cannot touch anyone. If anybody knew that she was having the issue of blood, and you know that usually they would be stinking as they walk in the crowd. And if anybody knows that she is an impure woman, she would perhaps even be stoned to death. How is it that this lady who's so impure would even have the courage to walk in the crowd and touch the hem of Jesus' garment? Simply because faith moves beyond obstacles. Amen. Faith moves beyond impossibilities that you see before you. That is where you reach out your hand in faith and see if you can touch the hem of his garment. The wonderful thing of what the Bible says is immediately, what did I say? Immediately, the moment she comes to her desperation and touches the hem of his garment, what happens? It says immediately. You know the story of Peter very well, isn't it? What was he? He was a fisherman. But when there was a storm that was taking place, and you know, when he asked Jesus whether he could walk on the water, and he begins to walk, and there was a storm, the first thing anyone should have done is just try to keep himself afloat. But you can see that Peter, instead of trying to swim, what did he do? He reached out his hand and said, Lord, help me. Somehow I begin to wonder, why did Peter try swimming? The moment you begin to reach out to God, the moment that we begin to give up on ourselves, that is when the miracle begins to take place. It says, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and lifted him. He 
Here is a wonderful promise in Isaiah 41, 17. It says, when the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. This morning we had several prayer requests, isn't it? Some un, probably unforeseen requests or requests that you cannot even utter in front of others. I want you to take hold of this wonderful promise that I, the Lord, will not forsake them. Immediately, it says that she was healed, just like how Peter was healed. But the thing is, we begin to understand a little bit about the mindset of Jesus. Why does he ask this ridiculous question? The question is, we know that in Luke 8, chapter verse 45, and Jesus said, who touched me? Who touched me? Peter, as impulsive as he is, he came quickly and said, Master, don't you know this? Why are you asking such ridiculous question? But only the master knows what he was asking. The question is, who touched me with that touch of faith? Because many times in our life we have these wonderful experiences where we go to God on our knees and God has done several things. Let me ask you this question. How many of us have our prayers answered in our life? And I'm sure that all of us will raise our hands. Uh, raise our hands. How many of us were in desperation and God had answered our prayers? I'm sure that everyone will say that. But the question is, has it left you the same as you had been before? Or had it brought a transformation? Because the evidence of transformation only takes place here as you see when you have an encounter. Did it lead to that transformation that takes place? Surprisingly, Jesus asked this probing questions in John the 6th chapter verse 36. He said, Jesus says this, you have also seen me and believe not. Another probing question in John 7 verse 5, neither did his brethren believe in him. Imagine for 30 long years that they were with Jesus and did not believe in him. Possible? Possible? Being in the church for 30 long years, 10 long years, and not have been transformed, remaining the same as we have been. Look at John the 10th chapter, verse 38. At least Jesus says he kind of begs us, believe the works. And this fascinating verse in John the 14th chapter, verse 9, have I been so long with you, and don't you know me? That's the reason why Jesus asked this question. It is not association with Jesus. It is not casual touch with Jesus. It is not rituals in the church. It is not coming and congregating in the church. The question that Jesus asked is, who has touched me? That profound touch that changes life forever. That is what Jesus is asking. And we pick this story again from Lancaster. You know, what is so fascinating is not what the shooting has taken place, but what happened after. I was really in tears as I began to read this. This community that had been shunned by the world, they have done something so unthinkable. That very day, when five of their children were mercilessly murdered, the community had gone to the house of this man whose widow was weeping and shocked to death with her three little children. And they begin to embrace her and comfort her in her sorrow. In the midst of this grief, they did not call the press, they did not call the attorneys, they did not make a show of anything. They did not point fingers to that man. That grandfather, that very day, went to the house of this widow, this murderer's wife. They invited the family of this lady to the funeral service of these girls 
that have been shot to death. But something even beyond that. They attended the funeral of Robert Charles. More than the non Amish people. You know who are there with the funeral? It was this Amish people. I happened to walk in that village and I happened to pick up a book. And I was reading about this story that touched me so much. You know what they have said? Why is this media making all this ado about forgiveness? Because forgiveness is something that must be spontaneous for a Christian. He said, we grow up with that. It is a part of our history and something that is written there that really shook me so much. He says, is that what Jesus had taught us to do? It is in our DNA. This community that had been shunned by so-called Westerners are able to showcase, in spite of the grief, a forgiveness that is beyond description. That is why Jesus begins to ask this question, who has touched me? We struggle with someone saying something against us and we become so unforgiving towards them. Look at this community that had demonstrated this, showcased this Christ-likeness like ever before. This morning, we are going to ask this question among all of us that are seated here. The question comes resoundingly clear, reverberating in our own ears. Has anyone touched Jesus? The touch that makes it so practical and so visible, and at the same time, there is no kind of audacity towards it. Christianity that becomes so clear in our walk of life, the way that these people have it written. No resentment, no anger, simple, pure, Christ-like forgiveness. Amen to that. That is why Jesus asks, who has touched me. Yes, we all have witnessed miracles in our own life. Jesus had healed us for sickness. We keep praying in the church. But the question is that has that led to a transformation period? A transformation that can demonstrate Christ-likeness in everything that we do. That is why Jesus asked the question, who has touched me? Who has touched me? Because many times Jesus, we begin to see Jesus is asking these questions that seem to be impossible. That seem to make us even begin to think again and again. And we ask this question, what do you expect from me, Lord? And he says, did you touch me? Have you touched me? Who touched me? This is the question that comes to us. And as Jesus begins to ask this question, it seems as if he's purposely delaying what was going to happen. Remember the background? Jay's daughter, his daughter was about the point of death. And the question that we begin to ask is, why is it that Jesus wants to make this woman a public display of what this woman had done? There's a reason behind this. Because by the time Jesus finished asking this question and this woman confessing that she has touched and was healed, something happened in the background. It says Luke 8, chapter verse 49, while he had spake, there cometh one from the ruler's synagogue and said, Don't bother the master. It's over. Done. Your daughter is dead. There's no point in this procession coming to our house. Did we have these experiences? When you begin to desperately ask God for attention 
and he allows other things to happen that delays it. Purposely, it looks like that. Jesus knew the problem. He could have simply rushed to the home of Jairus' daughter. But he begins to take his own time, his own pace, and begin to ask questions and stop here and stop there. And we begin to ask this question, Lord, why me? Why is it that I become the target? Why don't I find answers to the many questions that we have? Why do I become the target? I want you to understand some of these questions that Jesus began to ask. The ruthless commands that Jesus says. When there are 5,000 people, there was no money. He begins to say, feed them. When the ship is drowning and people are frightened about their lives, he says, fear not. When there's boisterous waves, he says, why do you doubt? And when the daughter is dying and dead, he says, just believe. We begin to ask this question, Lord, what is it that you're expecting from us? The reason why God gives the command is because he wants you and I to understand. The one who's giving the command, you're truly clueless of who it is that is saying that. He is the great I am that stands before you and asks you to do this. Not that you can do it with your own strength, but because he wants you to combine your weakness with his strength. And that is where the transformation begins to take place. Look at this wonderful passage. When men go forth to their daily toil, as when they engage in prayer, when they lie down at night or when they rise in the morning, when a rich man feasts in his palace or when the poor man gathers his children about the scanty board, each is tenderly watched by the heavenly father. No tears are shed that God does not notice. There is not a smile that he does not mark. It goes on further. It says, when good men go forth to their ta daily toil and engage in prayer, there is no tear that is shed that he does not mark. There is no smile that he does not take notice of. But listen to this conclusion. It says, if we would but fully believe this, what does it say? If we would but fully believe this, all undue anxieties will be dismissed. Our lives will not be so filled with disappointment as of now, for everything, whether great or small, would be left in the hands of God, who is not perplexed by the multiplicity of cares or overwhelmed by their weight. We should then enjoy a rest to our soul, to which many have long been strangers. Just on one condition, if we would but fully believe this. Is your heart burdened today? Is there some unresolved conflict that is trying to find expression in our life? It says, if we but fully believe this, all undue anxieties will be removed. We will then enjoy a rest for whom we all have been strangers. So the question that we come as we come to this conclusion is that why did God keep Jesus waiting? You know why? Because the wait is for a bigger miracle. Wait is for a bigger miracle. You remember Jesus had asked him only believe. Believe what? In fact, the reason why Jesus took time with this lady is he, give, he is giving a live demo of what can happen when you and I trust Jesus. As Jairus, daughter, as Jairus was walking along, he had to see everything taking place, pace by pace, moment by moment, frame by frame, of how you can trust Jesus. This lady never asked Jesus. She just touched and yet she got the benefit. Jesus was telling, just believe. Can't you see what has happened right in front of your eyes? The wait is because 
God wants to do a bigger miracle. Perhaps in your life there are things that are dying. Maybe your family is falling apart. Maybe your children are going astray. Maybe your health is failing. The wait is for a bigger miracle. And I want you to understand this from the next story that we have seen. You know why God does miracles in our own life? God does miracles for one purpose. And the purpose is to see that we are able to become embodiments of God's grace. The miracle that Jesus does in our life is not for us. Is to showcase it to someone else. In these two events that took place, the miracle of this lady is to be showcased to that man so that he can gain strength and faith in Jesus Christ for another transformation and for him so that the wait is for a bigger miracle. Because that was the time when Jesus had healed his daughter who had already died. Have you witnessed the miracle in your life? Yes, we testify and we are happy about it and excited. But do you know that that miracle is not for you alone? Amen to that? That miracle that God has done, He wants to showcase it so that you can strengthen the faith of another person whose daughter is dying, who's giving up their faith in God. The wait is for a bigger miracle. There was a little boy by the name of Tess. He was only five years old. He had an older daughter who was seven years. Uh, his name was Andrew and this girl's name was Tess. This boy had a problem in his brain for which he was slowly dying. Parents got together, they began to pray. They were trying to do their level best. They begin to sell one after the other, whatever money that they could borrow from others, they did that. But somehow, this boy was deteriorating. One day, this girl has heard the conversation between the parents. Behind the curtains, the father was saying, you know, we have done all we can. But the boy is not being healed. I don't have any more money. We need to sell this house. And even then, I don't think this boy will become all right. She said, why? Because he needs a surgery that we cannot afford. It is only a miracle that we need. The girl was hearing what the parents of God were saying, and she heard, we need a miracle to save this boy. Quickly, she ran to her Drawing, picked up the little coins that she had, counted them, rushed to the nearest pharmacy, and there she was waiting in line. The pharmacist, the in charge of the pharmacy, was talking very seriously with another person. She happened to wait and wait and wait, and yet he would not give attention to this little girl. So quickly she tried to make some noises, clear her throat, and yet he was not even giving attention to this girl. She took out a coin and began to tap on the desk. This man became so furious. She came to this little girl and said, little girl, don't you understand? I'm meeting my brother after many years, and I'm talking to him, don't you, can't you see? The tears in the her eyes, she says, but sir, I need a miracle to save my brother. What? Yes. See here, I have brought all the coins that I have. Can you help me in dispensing that miracle so that I can save my brother? How much do you have? One dollar and eleven cents. If you want, I can give you even more but kindly dispense this so that I can save my brother. 
The other man was keenly watching what was happening and this man was getting really upset. What do you think that you can buy a miracle with the one dollar and eleven cents? The brother of the pharmacist came forward and he said, just wait a minute. He came to this little girl and he said, little girl, what do you want? She said, I do not know my brother is dying. I have only one dollar and eleven cents. If you need more, I can care. And he said, take me to your home. That person who had seen this boy was a neurosurgeon. Um, and he said, this is just what I need to heal your brother. Dr. Carlton Armstrong he took this boy for one dollar and eleven cents. He did the surgery that transformed the life of this family. The question that we begin to ask this morning, are you waiting? I'm sure that we all have experienced the goodness of God in our own life. The reason God waits is for a bigger miracle he wants to do in our life and our life. And the question that comes resoundingly clear to us is who has touched me? In this whole congregation, we ask this question, did you touch Jesus? Has he transformed us? The miracles that God had done, if you enlisted, it is for someone else. The miracle that God had done, the goodness that God had shown in your life, in your family, is not just for you so that you can embrace yourself and your family and just begin to say, what a wonderful God we serve. It is for someone else. This morning we are asking this question as God begins to ask us, who has touched me? I'll be willing to go to my knees and say, Lord, just touch me. Touch me once again. A touch of faith that transforms each one of us. As we hear this song, a very old song, I want you to recount what God has done in your life. If God had already done that is good enough to transform each one of our lives. But if you're feeling that you are down in the dumps and God is still waiting, I want you to understand the wait is for a bigger miracle. As we hear this song, He touched me, shackled by a heavy burden, with a load of guilt and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me and made me old. I want you to listen to this song and begin to commit yourself and say, Lord, touch me once again. He touched me, oh, he touched me, and all the joy that floods my soul, something happened, and now I know he touched me and made me hope.
is true, I want you to stand to your feet as they're going to sing that chorus, He Touched Me, and we all can sing together. He touched me and made me whole. And I want, in case if God had not impressed you with the transformation that is required in your life, I want you to ask God and say, Lord, please touch me so that I can have an encounter that transforms my life. As we sing this song together, you to pray and ask God to touch us once again. He touched me. that in case the things are seemingly delayed it is because of a bigger miracle and the miracle that you have done in our life is for others I pray Lord that you transform us inside out touch us once again may we leave from this house of worship transformed, changed impacted Because we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Shall we repeat the Lord's prayer and have the benediction? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy May the grace of Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of us till we meet again. Yeah. Amen. Amen.
much for inviting us to worship together. It has been a great blessing. Thank you all. And so on behalf of uh, our church uh, uh, staff, Pastor Jeffrey, you can come here. Where is uh, Mr. Dr. Sonia Seven? Come here so they can all see. Where is Dr. Pastor uh, Justin? Please come here. On behalf of all of us, Hopeside, thank you for inviting us for this wonderful fellowship and worship. I've been here many years ago, and uh, probably about 20 years ago. So it's great to be able to come back and uh, worship with all of you. And so here are, here are our staff, and they'll say something on behalf of us. This is a praise. <laughs> it's a great, great pleasure to worship with all of you. And we have been uh, we have been hearing about Calgary Church uh, for several months now, and we always wanted to worship here together with you all. And at this time, we praise God for giving us this great blessing to be able to worship together. Hope you will have many more worships together. Thank you, Dr. Sonia. 2015 was a time where I was happy to hear part of uh, the ministry of Catholic Church and I think so this is the foundation for me in the United States where I could be able to uh, you know, grow the Lord's ministry and here I am when the nearly seven o'clock years and uh, Hopeside Church I uh, want to thank you for uh, you know giving me an opportunity to serve there with the army and uh, I'm very happy to know that this church gave me the foundation where I could move on and seven years of blessings ahead uh, I can never forget the day I landed here and I spent time here. Thank you once again and God be with you. Uh, let's all join together. The Lord is coming soon and uh, work together in wherever we are and uh, we could make an impact on people so that through our lives many more souls will have an opportunity to see Jesus. Maranatha, Jesus is coming again. Amen. Uh, once again, happy Sabbath and thank you all for inviting us to worship with you together and I hope and pray that this worship will continue even in the future and you all know that I'm not a new person here my sister Geraldine is a part of this church so once again I wish you all a blessed Sabbath and hope to see you all again thank you a special thank you to Dr. Arunan Sharma is the one who made it all possible, of course, with all of you. And so, thank you all, and we look forward to many times of getting together. Amen. Amen.